Hey everyone, let's get started. This is AI ML302, unlocking innovative AI use cases with text and multimodal embeddings. My name is Anand Ayer. I'm a group product manager in the Google Cloud Vertex AI platform, and I'm really glad to be joined on stage by my colleague Fabian, also a product manager in the Vertex AI platform, and Eric, CTO of innovative company Verve. Verve is a Google Cloud customer. Let's do a quick rundown of the agenda before we dive in. I'll start with a quick overview of what are embeddings. Then I'll pass things over to Fabian to do a cool demo with multimodal embeddings. Then Eric will talk about Verve and how they power innovative and differentiated experiences for their customers with embeddings. After that, we'll do some architectural patterns, talk about embedding tuning, and then it's uh, Q&A. For Q&A, we have a mic in the center of the room, so if you have a question, uh, we'd request you to walk over to the mic so that everyone can listen to your question. All right, so with that, let's, let's dive in. So what are embeddings? I call them the unsung workhorses of contemporary AI. You're not gonna hear much about embeddings in the news, but today, some of the most widespread and commercially important applications of AI are powered by embeddings. You're probably thinking, hey man, enough with the marketing spiel. What are embeddings really? Well, embeddings are a AI model generated encoding of content as a vector or an array of numerical floating point values. Typically, the content that is encoded as embeddings is unstructured content. So you have text or images and so forth, but it can actually be any type of content. Now, a good encoding or good embedding generating model will encode rich semantic information about the content in the embedding vector. So let's take as an example the Vertex AI text embeddings API. It takes text as input and it'll return an embedding vector of dimensionality 768. So what that means is the embedding vector that you get back has 768 numerical floating point values. Now 768 floating point values may not sound like much, it's just 768 numbers but the breadth and depth of semantic information that is captured by that embedding vector, nuanced semantic information, is incredible. So embeddings are a very powerful and versatile tool, and they're used in many creative ways. Often they're used as inputs to other downstream AI models. Today I want to touch upon the property that is by far the most popularly leveraged property of embeddings. So as I mentioned, embeddings encode rich semantic information about the content, right? So if you have two pieces of content that, have, that are semantically similar, then their embedding vectors should be similar. So if I computed a distance measure between the embeddings, then the embeddings of semantically similar items should be close to each other, and the embeddings of items that are semantically dissimilar should be far apart. And this property is by far the most popularly leveraged property of embeddings. So let's actually take a look at this example image here. So we have embeddings created from books. So we took the textual content of books, produced embeddings, and then the embeddings are projected onto a two-dimensional space. And that's the image you're looking at over there. And what we find is the embeddings for books that belong to the same genre, they typically cluster together. Now, this property of embeddings powers many, many compelling applications, and I'll pass things over to Fabian to actually demo one such cool application. All right, thank you, Anand. Um, thank you. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us in person this year in San Francisco. Um, so as Anand mentions, embeddings can be used to support a variety of use cases, and uh, today, I'm delighted to show you how embeddings can be used to create a blazing fast uh, multimodal product search experience. And for that, um, we built a demo, we've built a demo in partnership with uh, Mercury. Um, Mercury is a Japanese e-commerce company connecting millions of people uh, to shop and sell, uh, and sell items on their marketplace. So let's dive in. Okay. We'll start with the text-based semantic product search on the Mercury Marketplace. So one thing, for this demo, we 
only used product image uh, provided by Mercury as input and nothing else. No, the image are not tagged, there is no product description, anything like that. Okay, so here um, I'm searching for a stylish desk made out of metal. So you can see here that product search is happening on the fly and returns results really quickly. So here we're matching the embeddings of the text query with the embeddings of the, all the indexed product image. And I'm, I'm adding the product to my, to my cart. All right, so now let's try a more complex query. So here, I'm looking for a video game, but I just can't remember the name of it. So here's the query. A Nintendo Switch, okay, that's a console. Video game, we're narrowing down the video game with a red plumber as the main character. You may know who's that guy. Here we go, Super Mario 3D World, that's the one I'm looking for. So um, here again, we're only using product image and pure text image embeddings to match the user query with relevant results. And that kind of um, semantic search would be very difficult to properly handle with a conventional approach with you know, keyword base, for example. Okay, third example. Um, this is uh, an image-based product search. So here, all I have uh, is an image of a product that I would like to find on the Mercury Marketplace. Think about, you know, Google Lens, right? So here, all I need to do is take the photo, upload the photo I, I, I'm of the product I'm looking for. In that case, I snap the photo. Again, it's a Nintendo Switch cartridge game of uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild. Great game, by the way. And here I can see multiple options, right? So I'm picking uh, that one, that's a master edition. Perfect, all right, add to the cart. So here we've been matching the embeddings of the input image with all the embeddings of the, of the product image. And now I think I've got hundreds of hours of fun gameplay in front of me. Okay, so what makes that demo so unique? Well, it's fast, right? Um, you get search results within milliseconds, right? In the backhand, milliseconds to do matching while retaining a, a deep semantic understanding. Two, it scales very well. You know, for this demo, we used 5.7 million product image. Um, that, that's a lot, but that architecture, that architecture can scale out uh, to billions of products while maintaining the same blazing fast um, response time uh, and throughput as well. And third, uh, my favorite, it's easy, right? So here there is no data labeling involved, model training, um, just bring in your data and the Vertex AI embeddings API and vector search uh, will do the work for you. So before the deep dive into the architectural patterns uh, that we've been using uh, behind with, for that demo, I would like to introduce Eric Poff. Uh, Eric is Verve's CTO, and Verve has been uh, pioneering the use of uh, Vertex AI embeddings, and Eric will tell us more about their journey. Thank you very much. Um, excited to be here. Uh, my name is Eric Poff with Verve. We're a video-powered feedback platform. Uh, the name stands for a combination of video plus survey equals Verve. Uh, and our goal is to improve the world of customer feedback. Uh, because if you go out there and look, um, there's uh, a lot. If you go out there and look for um, uh, content reviews and ratings, uh, there's a lot of problems out there with that world. Uh, how can you trust the data? A lot of it's anonymous. Um, and if you're a brand or a company, how can you make decisions uh, based on that information? So with video uh, feedback, we introduce the human element into the process, capture all that information, make it authentic, right? And now as a brand, you have data you can trust so that you can make improvements to your products or services. Um, our opportunity then at Verve is, how do we make sense of all this data? And that's where embeddings come in. We embed everything. Uh, and let me uh, walk through a quick example. Uh, let's say you're a shoe company and you want to, uh, you have a new idea for a concept and you want to get feedback on it, test it out. Uh, we'll start with your customers. What, what are their likes? What are their dislikes? Um, 
What have they talked about in the past? We'll embed all of that, put that into a model, um, and then cluster it, and then we'll find the segmentations. So in this example, we have a segment down there in the bottom left. We'll launch a Verve to them, collect their feedback, embed all the information that they provided, and then we can produce results from that. So we can tailor those results to if you're a um, product designer, you're in research, or you're in marketing, all that stuff is powered by embeddings. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I, I figured I'd show you how easy it is to get, uh, to get going. Uh, so if, if you have ideas on how do I get started and, and I wanna use embeddings, here's what we did. We had an existing data flow where we had our data, we transcribed it uh, from the videos, uh, and then we introduced a, an embedding step where we'll embed that text, then we'll index it into a vector database, and then we'll, feed, we'll use that database um, to train our models, as well as serve, uh, serve all the insights into our application as well. So let me show you some real world examples. Um, I kinda wanna stress this out, that this, is, this stuff is live right now in our application. Uh, we're super proud about it. Uh, the first one is like object detection. Uh, so we've asked people to, hey, what's your favorite shoe? Uh, tell us what you like about it. Uh, we can then take that video, strip it out uh, into text, take the video portion of it, get the frames. We can then identify the objects in it and then do some, some what we call smart objects and smart detection, right? This provides a lot of value back to our customers so that I can now pick out what people are talking about and do uh, object identification. The next one we call magic wheels. So if you imagine we have hundreds and thousands of these campaigns out there at any one time, and we're collecting hundreds and hours of video, um, no one wants to sit and go through all that video. Uh, but with the power of embeddings, we can take that information and find out what are the highlights. So we have a highlighting model all built on embeddings, and we can tease all that information out and create like a four to five minute highlight reel. Uh, and we can also find the topics uh, for each one as well. So topic modeling, keywords, top phrases, and we can create highlight reels for all of those as well. Uh, and then last but not least is our, uh, we can summarize the data, we can uh, do recommendations, and we can also generate new ideas, right? So RAG, the retrieval augmented generation uh, kind of philosophy and framework, which I believe we'll be talking about a little bit, uh, we use that as well. It's all powered by embeddings. So we can take that information, generate summaries, we can come up with recommendations, where to go to next, um, and then also generate ideas. Hey, this, to solve this problem or pain point that consumers talked about, do this. So we feed all that into the LLM and get that information back. Uh, and at the end of it, we have what we call our brand AI, all powered by embeddings. So I'll hand it back to Fabian to talk about the architectural patterns. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, um, this is really exciting to see how Verve is using uh, AI and embeddings um, to extract novel insights uh, from uh, unstructured data. So now um, let's explore the architectural patterns uh, that are commonly used to put embeddings to work. Okay. To achieve embedding similarity in production at scale, we rely on two key enablers. One, the Vertex AI Embeddings API to generate embeddings, and two, the Vertex AI Vector Search to perform fast and scalable embedding similarity search. Okay, let's have a closer look at the first key enabler, generating embeddings. So to get an embedding, all you need to do is take your content, send your content, text, image, both, to an embedding API endpoint. The response will contain an embedding, which is a vector representation with a, with a deep semantic information of the encoded content that you can use in your downstream tasks. And today, Google Cloud offers two types of embeddings, text and multimodal. So which one to choose? Okay, if your goal is to create high quality text embeddings um, that you can use for text classification, question answering, for example, text embedding is the right choice. So this embedding uh, supports long form document as an input 
and generate embeddings in a 768 dimensional vector. If your use case involves um, image or pairs of text image, multimodal embedding is the one you want to pick. Multimodal takes image or text or both as an input and output a 1408 dimensional vector. Okay, the second key enabler is vector search. So vector search is used by Google actually internally um, with a search, play, YouTube, um, and many more uh, to provide fast and relevant search results as well as recommendation. So the challenge or the problem with vector search is, is very simple. It's how do I find similar embeddings really, really fast? As we've seen earlier, embeddings, um, uh, an embedding is a vector, right? Uh, and, and similarity search can be done by calculating the distance between, between those, those two vectors. So small distance suggests high similarity, and, um, and, and large distance suggests low similarity. So it's pretty straightforward. This is pretty basic math here. But it's not easy when you have to deal with millions or billions of embeddings, right? So you can try to, you know, just brute force it, right? But for an example, with the Macri demo, five, let's say five million product at, you know, 14 zero eight, you know, embeddings I mentioned, um, you need to repeat the calculation seven billion times, right? So th that's going to work, right? But it's going to take a very long time to finish and not provide the best user experience to say the least. So how can we solve for that? Well, uh, researchers have been studying a, a technique called ANN, uh, Approximate Nearest Neighbor. And ANN uh, uses vector quantization to separate the embedding space into multiple clusters um, with a tree structure. And that enables a fast and scalable search. Uh, and a few years ago, Google Research published a new ANN algorithm called SCAN, S-C-A-N-N. SCAN is considered as one of the best ANN algorithm in the, in the industry. And today, uh, Google Cloud developers, so all of you, can take the full advantage of SCAN with vector, Vertex AI vector search. So vector search, okay. Um, that's been called Vertex AI matching engine. We just changed the name. So you may already know that product. Uh, so vector search is a fully managed enterprise grade vector database that pretty does one main thing is calculating vector similarity very fast. So three um, key steps to use that, uh, that product. So one, take your embeddings and import your embeddings in vector search. Two, create an index to cluster the embeddings um, into um, um, embedding vectors into similar entities. And three, query a live endpoint uh, with your application to serve online prediction and get uh, search results. So why using Vertex AI vector search, right? So first, it's enterprise ready with you know, scalability and low latency. Again, you can perform search of a billion of embeddings at high throughput with super low latency. Two, it's a fully managed solution, right, that auto scales, for example, so that you don't have to worry about ma managing uh, the infrastructure and you can focus on building great products that delight your customers. And third, it's very efficient, you know, and basically thanks to the, the underlying algorithm, uh, as a result, it lowers your total cost of ownership uh, when compared to other approaches. Okay, now let's recap everything and see how we've used uh, Vertex AI Multimodal Embeddings API and Vector Search uh, to power the demo. So the, the flow really looks like the following. So the first phase is embed and index. So that happens offline, right? So you're, here you pass all your input data, in that case the 5.7 billion image, to the multimodal embedding API to generate the embedding. Then you insert those embeddings in the vector search database and trigger the creation of an index to enable similarity search. And then you got a live endpoint that you can query. The second phase, uh, is online, right? It's, it's at the, the search time. So here you pass your text query, so here a stylish desk or an image, um, to the multimodal embedding, um, and um, you get the embedding, and you take the resulting embeddings and send them as a query to the vector uh, search live endpoint. And finally, um, you get back 
ranked result, so here in the form of image that shares similarities with the text search, right? And they happen in different, uh, they happen, so it's, one side is embedding for text and embedding for image, but as they are sharing the same embedding space, you can, you can, you can make um, a comparison behind, between them. And um, yeah, that wraps up the architecture pattern overview, and now Anand will tell us more about how embeddings are used in the world of Gen AI. Thanks, Fabian. So at this point, you're probably thinking, yeah, embeddings are awesome, we're sold, but the title of this talk had the term generative AI in it, so we want to hear more about generative AI. So, all right, let's talk about how embeddings are used in the world of generative AI. Um, they'll be used in many creative ways, so today we'll just touch upon the two most popular ways in which embeddings are used in the world of generative AI. By far, the most popular usage of embeddings is to power this paradigm or family of architectures called Retrieval Augmented Generation. And thank you, Eric, for teeing it up for me. Um, retrieval Augmented Generation, honestly, it's a fancy way of saying, let's find and feed the LLM pertinent context and information at query time. This paradigm is also often referred to by the term grounding. So you may have heard the term grounding the LLM. So before we get into the architecture, let's look at what are the key problems we're trying to solve. The first problem we're trying to solve is that LLMs don't know your business data or your domain-specific data. LLMs are typically trained on public content from the internet, but they're not familiar with your data, and your data may matter the most for your use case. The second problem we're trying to address is that LLMs don't have real-time information. They, they do accumulate and, and encode a lot of information, but that's information up until the point that they were trained. Um, they're not accumulating new information after they're trained. So they may not have information from yesterday or last week or even last month. The third problem we're trying to solve is accurately citing sources of information. For many enterprise use cases, you want the LLM to give you the answer you're looking for, but also specify what is the source, the original source of that information. The thing is, LLMs, they do encode a lot of information within their parameters or weights. Um, that's called parametric knowledge. But when they give replies based purely on parametric knowledge, they struggle to cite the source. So what is the solution? The solution is, to find and feed the LLM pertinent knowledge or context at query time by using an information retrieval system. So this is the high-level architecture. At a high level, you start with the input prompt, and in the, in the world of generative AI, the word prompt is often used to refer to the input or the query that's passed to the model. So you start with the input prompt, and before you give it to the LLM, you actually call an information retrieval system that has indexed the information you want the LLM to use as context. You call the information retrieval system, you find the most relevant matches, you take the content of each match, and you append that to the prompt, then you take that augmented prompt and pass it to the LLM. So now the LLM has the original query, but also has a whole bunch of additional information it can use as context to answer the query. So let's actually take a look at a very a simple, an example of a simple architecture, a simple retrieval augmented generation architecture that can be created with the tools we've discussed so far in this presentation. So step one is to create the index. So you start with the document corpus or the knowledge base that you want to index. And you take the text of these documents and you call an embeddings API. If the documents are large, you may want to chunk them up into slightly smaller pieces. Now you want to take these embeddings and you want to put them in an embeddings plus content index. This embeddings plus content index consists of two things. One is the vector search solution, which Fabian described in detail. But here, in addition to finding the, the most similar vectors, what we want to do is also return the content associated with each vector. And for that, you can just use your favorite low latency key value store. I do want to call out that the updated uh, Vertex AI feature store now supports embedding management and retrieval capabilities. So you may want to check that out. Please check out AI ML 303 for more details. All right, so we have our index now. So what happens at query time? At query time, the user query comes in, the user prompt. You convert that to an embedding vector. You look up the embeddings plus content index. You get the top K most relevant matches. 
You append the content of those matches to the prompt, you pass it to the LLM and the LLM response. And there you have it, folks. That's a simple retrieval augmented generation architecture. Now let's look at the second most popular use of embeddings in the world of generative AI, and that is to empower LLMs with the, with the, the capability of memory. So what is the problem here? The problem is that LLMs don't have any memory of their own. They get a query, they process the query, they return the response, each query is independent for the LLM. They don't retain any information about the query or the response beyond the duration of the query. But there are many applications, particularly assistive chat applications, chat agents and so forth, where you actually want them to remember what was discussed in, you know, uh, a while back in the conversation or even remember what was discussed in prior chat sessions. Now, I do want to call out that when you're building a chat application, the most recent turns of the conversation, they are passed back to the LLM each time. So the LLM has the most recent context, but you actually wanted to remember you know, what was said a while back or in previous sessions as well, right? So what is the solution? Does anyone want to take a guess? The solution is to use embeddings and vector search. Um, so let's, let's quickly take a look at an architecture. So you have, so you have your long-term memory service. Um, in the long-term memory service, you use an embeddings API and you use the embeddings plus content index that we saw in the previous slide. Now you're having a chat session for each turn of the conversation. You take the prompt, you convert it to embeddings, you look up the long-term memory service to find the most relevant matches, you append it to the prompt, you give it to the model and the model response with the relevant context. Now there's one thing you have to remember here. You have to remember to put back the most recent prompt and the most recent response of the model in that long-term memory service, so you have it as context for downstream conversations. And again, there you have it, folks. And now, with, you know, it's, it's that simple to empower your LLMs with long-term memory. All right, moving along. Now let's look at tuning embedding models. And before we dive into this, I'm actually very excited to call out that the private preview release of tuning for the Vertex AI Text Embeddings API is now available. So, you know, we'd love for you to check it out. Now, when we talk about embedding, tuning an embedding model, let's start with why you may even want to do that. As you've heard us say multiple times <laughs> right now, embeddings encode rich semantic information, and then you do semantic similarity matching. But for your use case, what constitutes semantic similarity may be different in nuanced ways. Or the, the attributes that matter the most for your use case may be subtly different from some other use case. And I'll give you an example. So when you're doing semantic similarity matching, there may be a use case where uh, all you care about is the semantics or the meaning of the words in some piece of text or the objects in some image. Now there may be another use case where definitely the meaning of the words or the objects in the image matter, but what also matters perhaps more could be the style or tone of that content, right? So long story short, there are different use cases where different attributes matter more. So how do you tell the model what are the attributes that matter the most? Well, you actually do that by giving a whole bunch of examples to the model. Each example, and this is the input to the tuning job, each example is a pair of items and each pair, you specify if, the, if that pair of items is a semantically similar pair for your use case, or whether that's a semantically dissimilar pair for your use case, and then the model learns from that. So let's actually take a look at how the model learns. I wanna show a simple architecture for embedding model tuning, but what I wanna call out is the goal here is to give you an intuition of what is happening. The actual implementation we use under the hood for the Vertex tuning, uh, Embeddings Tuning API is actually far more sophisticated. We won't have enough time to dive into that. So I'm just gonna give you the intuition of what happens when you're doing embedding tuning. So what happens when you use an embedding generating model? You have your content, you pass it through an encoder, you get embeddings. But now remember that when you're doing tuning, you provide a whole bunch of examples and each example has a pair of items. So for each item in the pair, you have the encoder and you produce embeddings, right? Now let's take a similarity function and produce a similarity score for those embeddings. And a common similarity function is cosine similarity. There are other similarity functions as well. So you're computing a similarity score. Now for the items, 
in your example that are semantically similar for your use case, you want that similarity score to be as high as possible. And for the items that are semantically dissimilar for your use case, you want that similarity score to be low. And that is essentially what we're doing when we're tuning the model. We're updating the weights of the encoder. The parameters of the encoder are updated so that the similarity score is high for the semantically similar examples, and the similarity score is low for the semantically dissimilar examples. And that's how embedding tuning works. Um, really cool stuff, right? And uh, yeah, we would love for you to check it out, and I'll pass things over to Fabian to talk about how you can get started. Um, OK, so here we are providing a few pointers uh, to Google Cloud product uh, to help you create, um, use, and tune embeddings. And finally, if you're looking for a uh, more turnkey solution, out-of-the-box out of solution um, that for embeddings-based um, search product, you can ch check uh, Vertex AI Vision Warehouse, which is a fully managed um, service to cover your media content, um, storage, and search needs, for example, videos and image, and Vertex AI uh, Search uh, to serve all your search needs with enterprise content, such as web page, tableau documents, PDF, and so on. And uh, for more information, you can always get in touch with us uh, through your Google Cloud contact.